tell you, uh, there's so much in my wife, and she's, as she prophesied over you, uh, what's really amazing is that I've been setting restaurants, and she would look over at me and say, I have a word for that guy sitting right over there, <laughs> that she didn't even know, and uh, I said, well, you better obey God, and so I've seen my wife, who, she's the quiet one, I'm the mouthy one. <laughs> You know that feeling. No. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they're, they're the pretty ones. We're the not so pretty ones. Okay. Anyway. Um, and I've seen my wife, that soft spoken, get up and go speak the word of the Lord over people that she's never met. And uh, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. You, you better know you've heard from God. Yeah. 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 And that takes place. So. Would you guys mind if I stood right down there? No. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, today, uh, I want to thank you. It's been, it's been over three years since we've been here with yeah. you guys. And um, most of you know, uh, during those three years, we faced a lot of challenges, a lot of things in our family. Most of being uh, the loss of our grandson, uh, my son Nathan's uh, uh, baby, um, Jackson, six years old, and uh, your pastor so blessed us with his words, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's people like you guys that uh, helped us, helped us when Jackson drowned, and uh, I'm just... Right during that time, I had some illness, and really, I've just been able to travel again the last year, as God has strengthened my body, because I remember when David would be at my house, and I couldn't hardly get up and walk to the kitchen, yeah. and, uh, but he could still come and eat my groceries. Yeah. No and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but we, we thank you for your prayers. You know, there's something about ministry that we have to get past the surface, and, and ministry it's, has to get on a level of relationship. And there, I've just learned that there are some people that you meet, and then there are some people that God just strategically puts in your life. Okay? We just didn't meet you, pastors. God strategically placed us in each other's lives. And so we, we count it an honor to be, to be here. And uh, I wanted to say, before I get into this... Uh, it's an honor for me because I have two ladies here that I haven't seen in over 40 years. Everybody say, Pastor, you don't look that old. Anyway, uh, but uh, right back here, I have Colleen Wil uh, Wilcoxon and Barbara Bowles, who uh, they, they were, uh, we all graduated from high school together. Wow. Uh, and we went, we went to school. We went to school in Marinci, Arizona. That's not a cuss word. That's actually a place where, where, we, where we live. And uh, Marincia, Arizona. And uh, I literally, I, I put on Facebook, because I have a lot of friends from school that uh, I'm on Facebook with. My wife hates it that I'm on Facebook. But anyway. Uh, and I put that up. We were going to be here today. And they were kind enough to show up. And so this, this is these ladies right back here. It, it means a lot that you would come today. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Pastor, I'll give you $100 a piece after service. <laughs> okay, maybe more. We'll see. We'll see what the offering looks like. But anyway, uh, I want to. This message this morning is not, is not typical for me because um, normally I would share something like this just in our own, our own house. But um, I just sat down a few days ago and 
jotted it down on pad. And so I want to tell you guys a, a, a story first to begin. Where's it? Where's Cam? Where's Cam? Where's that basketball? Right here. All right. Any hoop players in here? Any basketball players? Are there any any who used to play basketball like, like me and Dave? We first time we ever met, not first time we met, but first time he came to Oklahoma, we played basketball against some guys and we smoked them. Man. Yeah, we did. We smoked them. And uh, I played um, I played basketball at Marinci High School. Uh, graduated there in uh, some year. And um, it was 1972 when I graduated. And I played some basketball. I mean, I wouldn't break. I could, I might have could have played at the junior college level or whatever. But uh, we got to go to the state tournament, state playoffs. Well, before that, during the season, we had our arch rivals with Clifton, Arizona, only a few miles apart. And these girls were probably at this game that I'm going to talk, talk about. Yeah, they're already going. They, they remember. And uh, here's, here's what happened. Uh, Clifton was class B, and we were class A. And they were num ranked number one in the state. And we were ranked not number one in the state. <laughs> and, uh, and so they came to our, our gymnasium, and we're, pl we're, we're playing them. And it's a tight game. They let us the entire game. And... Uh, I mean, we packed uh, what seemingly, I mean, I don't know, the multitudes were in the stands. There was stand, standing room only in this gym that would seat 500 people. And, uh, and so we, uh, we played and, and got right down to the end of the game, and I stole the ball. Or I, I mean, I drove the lane, and I, I made a basket, and it put us behind by one point with just about four or five seconds left. And they threw the ball in, and I stole the ball. And this is very uncommon for me. And uh, I stole the ball, and I hit it for the goal. And I, as the, as the buzzer went off, I laid the game-winning shot layup that put us ahead by two points. And the buzzer goes off, and I mean, the crowd is going crazy. The cheerleaders are hugging me. And, uh, and I mean, just a, it, was just, it was an awesome, awesome setting, man. I was the hero. And then all of a sudden, after the crowd noise goes down, I, I could hear a whistle. And I look over to ref, and he's going, no basket. No basket. And he said, I have a foul before the shot. And so what it was, with no time left on the clock, the referee took me to the free throw line, and there was nobody else on the court, no other players. It was just me and the two refs. And he gives me a one-and-one, one, where if I make the first one and then I make the second one, we win. If I make the first one and miss the second one, then we tie, we go to overtime. But baby, if I miss the first one, we get beat. So I, I got this ball and the multitudes were watching. And that basket seemed like it was about 75 yards from me. And I shot, and that ball went around at least 32 times around the, <laughs> around the rim. Were you guys there? Anyway. And it rolled out. And we lost. So in a period of about three minutes, I went from the hero to the goat. I went from the cheerleaders hugging and kissing me to now they're they're hugging and kissing the other guys, you know. And and and, and it was it was it was the 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 range of emotions of the high and, and you know everybody wants to wants the, the game winning shot and, and then the low of being going from the hero to the goat was just so unbelievable. And uh, I just hung my head. Walked into the locker room. All my teammates beat, beat me up. Uh, no, but, uh, you know, I tell that story because uh, there's something that it reminds me of. It reminds me of the power of relationships. Because relationships have the power 
to be the most fulfilling and exciting adventure in life. And they can also have the power to be the most painful yeah. and the most hurtful thing that we have ever experienced in our life. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. I will tell you guys this. If you guys talk to me and amen me, we get out of here quicker. <laughs> okay. If you don't... So, I'm going to talk about some relationships here. You know, because relationships, you know, we, we, we can soar like the eagle or we can crash and burn. The, the truth is, is that many of us have experienced the good, the bad, and the ugly in relationships. And, and I know that if we don't know how to transition the good and the bad, then we become the ugly. Ooh, Ooh. come on. Ooh. That'll preach. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> If we don't know how to transition the good and the bad, then we become the ugly mm -hmm. in any relationship. And so I want to start, before I give you a few points here, I want to start by telling you our story. I, I don't normally share this in a lot of places. Um, but lately, a couple of places, the Lord has released me to share this. Phyllis and I have been married now for years. And uh, it's been 41 years. Okay. We, uh, we were on staff at a Valley Christian Assembly in Phoenix, Arizona. Maybe you know Pastor Zane Anderson of Victory. Uh, it was a staff where Zane was there. I was there. The youth pastor, Zane was associate. Our, our head pastor was Leroy Cloud. And um, I... Uh, I had an invitation to go, oh, this would have been 19, a long time ago, anyway, <laughs> probably 30 years ago, and I had an invitation to go speak at a banquet on a Saturday night across the West Valley of Phoenix, and when I, on my way back, I drove by a church, it, it was kind of in a, in a, rundown area where I used to be a youth pastor and there was an older couple who used to live there by the church who I hadn't seen and it was it was uh, amazing uh, they were an amazing couple and I thought well, I'll pull in here and see if uh, see if they're home say hi to them well when I pulled in there I went up and knocked on the door uh, they had a daughter that was 25 years old who answered the door. I had just turned 30, and uh, it was hot, summertime, uh, invited me in. I, I'd only met her once or twice, uh, didn't hardly even remember her name. And I won't get into any details, but I'm just telling you, before I left that house, there were things that went on that should never have went on. And there were things that went on that were ungodly and that no man of God should should do. Okay. I uh, when I left there, the shame that I I felt. And by the way, many of you have heard us preach this message on freedom and release, hope for captives and prisoners, and we talk about shame. Uh, if you don't have any money, you can get one for free out there. Uh, but the shame that I felt when I left was just, I, I drove straight, this was before cell phones, I drove straight to a phone booth. And I called my pastor, and I told him what had happened. And then I went home, and I told my wife what happened. Um, the next Sunday, I stood up in front of about 600 people in the church and I confessed to my inappropriate sinful actions. And the church was very, very, um, I mean, they just loved on us both. And uh, 
I was the I was the youth pastor. I was also the worship leader there, and um, it was difficult. The Assemblies of God didn't know much about restoration and how how to restore people and help people, and so they put me on what was called a two year probation period, where for six months I couldn't do anything in the church. After six months, I could lead worship again. And then and after a year, I could, I could teach and preach. And then at two years, I could get my credentials back. All right? So they placed, they placed me in a, a group therapy class of about 10 or 12 people. And I went to a group therapy for about two months. But as I look back, there was never a time where anyone just one-on-one, -on -one, just sat down and said, what's happening with you? I mean, we all need that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, nobody ever sat down and said, because the truth is, is that God's not so concerned as what we do as he is as to why we do what we do. Mm. Come on. Okay? Yes. And in six, so I went to that for a couple months. There was no one who ever sat down with my wife because I mean, you know that she was the one who was taken captive. She was the one who was violated. Yeah. No one ever sat down with her. So at the end of six months, they let me begin to lead worship. I picked up my guitar. I began to sing. And they said, the anointing's back. He's back. The anointing's there. Let me tell you something. The anointing was never my problem. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. That's right. It's real. We can't use anointing as a, as a barometer. Right. And so I, after a year, I started teaching and preaching. We're doing seemingly wonderful. Then in 1987, uh, from that church, Phyllis and I and our three sons, we moved to Flagstaff, Arizona to start a church. And uh, when we got there, we started with about 25 people in a school. The first day that we started in a school, there was about 10 inches of snow on the ground. And uh, we started with 25 people, and a year later, we got 300. I mean, we're, we're crammed in this auditorium, this uh, gymnasium they were in. And, I mean, we were, it, man, it was blown and gone and having guest speakers in and just, I mean, it was just, we had a powerful worship team where some of them moved up there with us and, and it was, but you know, I, I learned something that in, in my life, I was at the height of my prophetic gifted ministry but inside, I was at a low. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 Think about it. Okay. And uh, so after two years, I mean, we're, like I said, we got 300 people. Because that's all we could put in that gym. We had bought five acres of land not too far from the college. We were getting ready to break ground on a 500-seat multi-purpose facility. And uh, just had sixty thousand dollars in the bank. We moved there with nothing. And I uh, got into a situation with a woman in a counseling session. And I'll just say, now I'm a second time offender. And so, I went and told the church council member, and then I went home and told my wife. Then we called the Presbyters, and we cried all the way down the mountain. I remember laying my head on my wife's lap and weeping. 
asking her to forgive me. We went from the Golden Boys to our phone stopped ringing. We moved to Phoenix. We lost friends. We had family members write us off. We had family members write her off because of my, because of me. Right? And so, uh, we came down, and fortunately, there's a, there was a, uh, two people in ministry, they were brother and sister, that was Dr. Judson Cornwall, who's since gone to be with the Lord, <coughs> and his sister, Dr. Iverna Tompkins, they took us and placed us in counseling. And we, we went for counseling once a week for two years. Not two months. Two years. And sometimes I'd go by myself. Sometimes those go by herself. There were times we went and took our kids because our, our kids, they were in a place where we loved. Their grandparents were, were in Flagstaff. And all of a sudden, they're, they're yanked. They don't know anything. And they, don't, they don't have their friends. And there were times that we'd take our kids in the, in the council with us. But we wanted, we wanted to... We wanted some healing. Sins of God dismissed us. And uh, we stayed out of full-time ministry for almost five years. And God did so much healing in our lives. Only friends we had were each other. I could talk a whole lot about this, but I'm, I'm just telling you. You talk about relationships. You talk about the highs and the lows in relationships. And in our book, when we talk about shame, it's not something I mean, we walk through it. Yeah. We walk through it. And so our move to Conwall, Oklahoma 22 years ago was our step back into ministry. And since then, God has blessed us many, many times. And so quickly, and you guys know what the word quickly means? It means, it means absolutely nothing. Okay? I want to give you some obstacles to healthy, healthy relationships here. Okay? I don't know why I'm doing this, because like I said, I normally would talk, teach this in, a, in our church, but it, this is for some people here today. One of the first challenges in any relationship is deciding who's in control. Okay? Now, are there any, are there any elementary teachers here? Anyone here that teaches elementary school? Okay. You know, in her class, what grade do you teach? I teach special ed. So special. I teach all, all okay. Grades. You can take any first grade teacher, and she can point out to you the one or two kids in her class that think that they run the world. Is that right? Exactly. There's just always some of, some of those, those those kids, and 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 and, and some of us uh, here, since we were young, we decided that we were going to be the ones that that run the world. I was one of those kids. So so now when I'm at home and I'm in my recliner, I want the remote control in my hand. <laughs> some of you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Because I want to be in control. If I don't have, my wife can have the remote control and she can watch three different things on TV and know what all of them are going on back and forth. It drives me bananas. I just want one. And she says because men can't multitask. But anyway. And, uh, and that's because every fight is about who's in control. I don't care if it's with a sibling, it's parents, it's work, it's church. Every fight on any level is about who's in control. That's why God never intended for one person to be in charge of anything. Now, the kingdom of God has plurality, all right? He said, let us create man. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Moses was leading Israel and God gave him Aaron. Then he appointed elders. God never intended for one person to run anything. And then when we see when Jesus come, comes along, he sends his disciples out two by two. We see Paul going out with <laughs> Barnabas. We see Paul and Silas. And they, they structured their, their, the, the New Testament church with elders, apostles, po uh, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists who served as elders to the local house because God doesn't believe that any one person should run anything. That's why he met man and a woman as a team. <coughs> Not a king and a concubine. Is this okay? Right. Unfortunately, the church has, has bought into the lie of control. And so men try to run their marriages like they are a CEO of a corporation. We call it, we label it the head of the house. The buck stops with me. I'm the one who's supposed to, we, we don't use the word control, but that's what we mean. And it becomes destructive because we don't read the rest of the story when the scripture says, men love your wives as Christ loved the church and, and gave himself for, for her. Before that, it said, it said, wives, submit to your husbands. All the men love that scripture, but we don't read the one after where it says, it says that we're supposed to love our wives as Christ loves the church. And even before that, it says that we are to submit one to another. Is Cameron in here? I can't. He's in the back. He might be in the booth. Okay. Let me uh, let me see. Let me pick on someone down here. Uh, let me uh, let me pick on uh, this this gentleman right here. The, got his arms. arms. Oh, he looks strong. Come stand up. Stand, stand up here. I need your help for a second. Come here, come here Jesse. Come on. Everybody, give Jesse a hand. <laughs> now, I want this. What's your name, son? Come here for just a second, okay? I want you two guys right up here, all right? <coughs> now, what I want is I want, I want you guys to look at each other like you're two UFC opponents, <laughs> okay? Now, we're not going to hit or kick or anything like that, but we're going to wrestle. Okay? Now, I want you... Because how many know that when God, one guy, guy gets one down, the guy taps out, he's what? He's, they, he's, they, yes. he's in submission. Right. All right? So I want you guys to count three, just wrestle for a second. <laughs> one. Yeah, let me hold this. Sorry, one. One. One, two, three. You guys, wrestle, wrestle, wrestle. Jesse, come on. Jesse, come on. <laughs> Thank you, guys. You, you can sit down. Uh, now, you see, what we've done in the church is we've taken one scripture where we, we talk about the weaker vessel. Is that right? Yes. Right. And uh, we make the theology out of it. That's good. Was he the weaker vessel? And he was the stronger vessel? How is it possible... For a weaker to submit to a stronger. You can't. Now, let, let me share this with you. My grandfather in Oklahoma, when I was a little kid, I'd go with him and I'd be about that size. I was that size, Colleen, I'll tell you, it's true. I was, I was, man, when I was a freshman in high school, I was four feet eleven and weighed eighty-nine pounds. I was a hunk. I'm telling you. By the time I was a senior, I could dunk a basketball. But anyway, uh, 
I would go visit my grandfather, and he'd go to milk the cows in Oklahoma, and he'd have two buckets, milk buckets, and he'd go like this, and he'd, he'd walk, he'd walk like this. And I was so young that I couldn't keep up with him. And so as he was walking, he would look back, and then he would submit. He would adapt. One of the meanings for the word submit means to adapt. And he would slow down, and he would adapt so that I could walk with him. And then years later, as I, I, as I grew up and he was older, I was the one carrying the milk bucket. And I was the one who had to submit and adapt to him. You guys see that? All right. So, thank you guys for the UFC bout to me. I'm not going to get through all these. The, the second obstacle to healthy relationships is, is dealing with crisis. How I many you know that Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation? And yeah. IV says you're going to have trouble. It's crisis. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That, that's why it's so important for us to learn how to resolve conflict. Now, listen. In our homes, peace is not the absence of, of conflict. <laughs> peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is the ability to resolve conflict. Okay? I said I'm a young couple. They're 18, 19. They're going to get married. They're, I just want to throw up half the time they're talking to me. <laughs> it's like, so, you see, oh, I love it. Anyway, you know, we're going to get married. It's all... It's all it's, and I said, so, uh, you guys had a good fight yet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. no we, we never had a fight. And I said, well, I'm going to pray before you get married that you have a good one. <laughs> okay? I'm going to pray that you have a good fight. before." And they, they thought I was on another planet. I said, because you need to learn how to resolve conflict. I have seen relationships go opposite ways not because they didn't love each other. People that I knew loved each other but they had no ability to resolve conflict. That was us. And uh, my heart is heavy right now because I have a, I have a very good friend. He his wife had pastoring for for many years in Oklahoma. You don't know. They're separated and on the verge of divorce right now because of this, because of his anger. Anyway, I won't go there. The third thing, lack of accountability. For, for relationships to be healthy, every person in the relationship has to be accountable to everyone else who's in the relationship. All right? I was on a plane coming back. I think I was coming back from Vietnam about 10 years ago. And I, and I sat on a plane next to a guy, and he's all tattooed up and got all the hardware. And started talking. He was a bass player for a ska band that they had been touring Europe uh, the band was the band was called Real Big Real Big Fish. I don't know if anybody heard that heard that band, but anyway, uh, I get to talking to him, and he told me he said, "Man, he said, yeah, I'm excited. I, I get to go home." He said, "I I, I married my girlfriend and I got married, and we were married for a month." And he said, "And then I had to leave to go to go on this three month tour," and said, "She's like a third grade teacher back home in L.A.," and I said, "But I'm afraid she's going to be mad." Um, Afraid she's going to be mad when I get home. I go, why? He said, man, I, I haven't called her in a week. And I, and I go, so why do you think she'd be mad? I said, do you think she's mad because you're touring Europe while she's taking care of the third graders? That's not why she's mad. I said, she's upset because she just wants to know that when you're off doing your thing, that you're thinking about her. That's right. Amen. Amen. There you go. Okay? 
every relationship, there has to be accountability. And I just want to say, sir, if you're here and you get upset every time she asks you where you've been, or how, did you have to work late, or, or, or vice versa, I'm telling you, every healthy relationship embraces accountability. Our boys lived, up, lived I think Jonathan lived up with us until he was 40. And, uh, <laughs> how old was he? He was 29 when he, Jonathan? He was, he was that old for him. Okay. Anyway, uh, I showed up, with, I just showed up where they told me to go for the wedding. So. Uh, but when our boys were in college and at home, we were, they were accountable. Okay? I told them, I said, look, if you're not home by midnight, call me and let me know because I don't want to get up at 3 in the morning and do what old people have to do at 3 in the morning and, and look out and see your car gone. I want to know. There's an accountability factor. Anyway, healthy relationships. All right? Then... Uh, Number four is unmet needs. All of us have unmet needs. When I expect my wife to meet every need that I have, I set her up for disappointment. Mm -hmm. I set myself up for disappointment, and I place her as God. When I expect her to meet every need, and the way that we work, the way that we learn this, and our counselor taught us this, Counselor taught us this, and, and so we learned to do this. Instead of getting mad and waiting for the other person to meet a need, we would, I, I come in, and I tell her she's having a bad day or whatever, I go, honey, what do you need from me? But she would look and ask me the question, what do you need from me? And that question, listen, that question will save a lot of marriages right there. Wow. If you learn to ask that question, instead of expecting them to know what you want, ask that question, right? And then the last obstacle to healthy relationships is an unwillingness to forgive. If you're here, if you're here this morning and you want to know about forgiveness, you need to corner my wife after the service and talk to her. Because like I said, I laid my head on her lap and she was able to forgive. You see, love and forgiveness doesn't condone sin. That's right. Okay? It creates an opportunity for us to come out of sin. All right? Give me that basketball again, please. It was about three years after I lost that game. I was playing at, in a tournament at Grand Canyon College. And uh, we played this team, and they were ahead of us the whole, the whole game. And I made a shot and put us, you know. And as the buzzer went off, we were one point behind. As the buzzer went off, they called a foul. And with no time left on the clock, the referees marched me with the basketball to the free throw line with nobody else on the court. And they tell me, you got a one and one, you know, blah, blah, blah. I go, I understand this one. <laughs> I, I understand this one. I know what's at stake here. All the other team. Both teams are, it's me and two. I've never seen that happen to anyone, but it's happened to me twice. <laughs> and so I said, Jesus. Jesus. And so I shot and I made the first one. And then I shot and I made the second one. And we won the game. And let me say, what do you think the difference was between the first time to the second time? The difference was this. I never stopped playing. Amen. You see, some of us go through a divorce and we don't want to play anymore. 
some of us go through things that we went through. And we want to give up on the game. We don't want to play. But because I didn't stop playing the first time, I won the second time. Yeah. Everybody with me? Yeah. Amen. 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 Let's bow, let's bow our heads. Hallelujah. Woo!